Warning, this broadcast is for mature audiences only. Do not attempt to perform similar stunts with your own FileMaker servers unless you're trying to get the attention of your boss. The server crashes in today's broadcast are performed by certified professionals. Do not attempt this at home. Viewer discretion is advised. That music is... Oh, pretty really good, you know. You've been all everyone's been warned, yeah, you know. All right, Jesse, you're ready to go, That's babe. Awesome. I feel like there needs to be some sort of like coding montage that goes with that music. Like I totally felt like I was in a, I was, I, I, but then I was imagining what a boring montage. It would just be me staring at the screen. Sometimes a dog is in my lap, sometimes not. <laughs> Coding the time. <laughs> I want to welcome everyone to an awesome day. I'm in my Santa Clara office today broadcasting live at fmtrain.tv. I'm Richard Carlton, creator of fmtrain.tv, where we do lots of great, amazing things all the time. So real quick, a little bit of housekeeping before we fully start. I'm going to cover yeah. Jesse's face up briefly here. If I go to fmtrain.tv, you press the live tab on the left side. You can come up with the current broadcast schedule for the next six days. We have, we're booked out about 30 days out right now, so everything's kind of set up. Uh, today is Jesse Barnum Day, where we all swing uh, the flags and say we love Jesse. Real quick, as a reminder, this broadcast is brought to you totally live, but it's <clears throat> this broadcast is brought to you by fmtraining.tv. We get the latest in FileMaker training at an amazing low price. Visit fmtraining.tv and press the bundles button and choose a bundle. This is how you support the channel, right? Those, those of you wondering, it's totally free, but we do appreciate you helping the channel out. Um, at a minimum, if you're on YouTube, make sure you upvote us or write a note or something salacious in there. That is the upcoming broadcast schedule and how you support us by going and buying our training subscription. Because at the end of the day, it's only an hour every day. In fact, I remember talking to Jesse about it and this is like a year and a half ago. And I said, hey, Jesse, you want to kind of like help out with this daily live stream? And he goes, dude, that's like a live, it's like a dev con session every day. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I think the words out of his mouth were no, right? So <laughs> I think that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, because it's a lot of work. So so we bring it's Jesse by about once a quarter, whatever we're gonna we're trying to get like on a rotating schedule. If he's not here, we'll have the puppet conversation. We chat with about our, our Jesse puppet. The idea is that so here's so here's the reality with FM Trainer TV and my company. We have about 30 engineers and we only let people come here whose products we actually use. And so Jesse is here because I use his products and I believe in Jesse and he does a great job with tech support. He cares. Um, you can always find someone who's had a bad experience with some product one way or the other, but I can tell you that, um, is that it's not that 360 makes perfect products, but they work really hard to fix the boo-boos when they show up, right? Does that make sense, everyone? So I kind of expect things to like eh, come up, but then I call Jesse and Jesse's all over it. So. The reason you missed the last broadcast, Jesse, is you were working on product updates, right? Yes, I was, yeah. Why don't you tell us, give us your official excuse, your dog ate your homework, you weren't here. What were you doing? Uh, mirror sync and safety net. Those are my two things that I work on a lot. Uh, and this the last three weeks, basically, have all been safety net. Okay, now, um, I have not worked on, I've used safety net. It sounds mm -hmm. like some sort of... Uh, birth control or something. I'm not sure what that is. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be our new logo. Uh, yeah, I'm a little concerned about my FileMaker <laughs> server birth control. So, what kind of birth control do you have, and why do I want your birth control? Uh, so, Safety Nets. It's it's actually an old product. We originally wrote it. We wrote version one. I I don't remember for sure, but I want to say it's like 2013. Okay. Um, and uh, the idea behind the original Safety Net was. Uh, use this uh, feature that Amazon had called DevPay, which has since gone, but that's kind of, I'm getting to that, uh, where essentially uh, Amazon had a deal where you could write stuff to S3 and they would take care of all of the administrative details about billing people's credit cards for the storage and stuff like that, and they would pay a commission to the developer that wrote it. So we wrote this plugin at the time. It's no longer a plugin, um, but uh, this was back in, uh, oh, this is older than 2013 now that I think about it. Uh, but yeah, we wrote a plugin that was a server-side plugin that you would install, and it would create a web interface where you could manage off-site backups that would write to S3. And uh, so that's the kind of the genesis of safety. Amazon then, um, in 2016, 2017, 2018, something along those lines, they canceled that dev pay program. Um, and so safety net kind of languished and didn't really have a lot of updates during that time. 
because we had no way to build people's credit cards. Um, <laughs> and there's so always that. There's always point, there's always the money part. You can't get to it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Giving away free cloud-based storage uh, is not a winning business model. Um, and so uh, so we we've really kind of picked it up, dusted it off, and really uh, just overhauled it from from top to bottom. Uh, it now, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I've got a slide on what's changed and what's new. And I don't want to get the slides yet. I know demos are more fun than That's slides. That's fine. Jesse, why don't you start the show? Tell us what we're doing here and why we're here. And why, 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 I'm going to say this very plainly for all of you, Claire's people don't use FileMaker. Why do we give a shit about 360? Why? Okay. Go, yeah, Jesse. So, sure. I think the best way to answer that question is, should I just jump into demos? Because I think the sooner I do the demo, the sooner you'll be like, oh, I get it. Let me show you my screen. So normally when I do demos, I don't like show the installation process because it's just kind of boring. But this is a really short demo and I just kind of want to show how easy this is to get running. So here's, here's basically what I'm going to, what safety net is. Safety net is a very easy to install, very easy to configure solution for doing offsite backups with FileMaker server. So if you've got FileMaker server, uh, obviously you're doing backups, which is good. But then the question is, what happens if something happens to your physical FileMaker server? What happens if somebody, uh, you know, hacks your server? What happens if you uh, delete all your records and that overwrites your most recent backup? Yep. What if your backups just aren't running and you think they're running and unbeknownst to you, you check a month later and find out that that entire month no backups are happening. So here's, so I want to just kind of show you guys from the top 360. So we're starting from scratch here. We go to the 360 works website. We go to products. We come to safety net right here. Come in here. Uh, I already own a license, uh, license. So I'm just going to click this download current version that downloads safety net. Um, it's, uh, all of our, all of our, we use Amazon for everything. All of our downloads are hosted on S3. Our backups will also be to Amazon S3. If you're not familiar with S3, while well, I'm waiting for this download to run, <laughs> um, it's <laughs> it, the, the download definitely runs a lot faster when I'm not screen sharing and talking on a video. Right, game. right, right. That's why uh, it's doing that. Yeah, game. yeah. Uh, the um, S3 is uh, uh, stands for simple. Oh, geez, what? simple something storage. All right, uh, hey Jacob Taylor, feel free to unmute yourself if you have to help Jesse here. So. Yeah. So. Simple, simple scalable storage, simple something storage. Let me let me help uh, let me help everyone with this. So S three <laughs> is basically a giant FTP server in the sky. They don't call it FTP, but that's kind of like the net effect of what it kind of does, right? So if you put files someplace mm -hmm. and you mostly don't stare at them and they're like off in the periphery, like FTP, that's what this is. So for plain for normal yeah. humans who want to talk to Jesse, let me translate. So I'm doing sorry, translation. Go go. And and so S3 is designed to be, Amazon calls it highly durable and everyone calls everything highly durable, but Amazon's really serious about the highly durable part. Um, I think they say that S3 has like 11 nines of backup of, of reliability. So that's 99.99 and then with nine more nines after that. Um, so it's extremely reliable. Um, it's very fast and it's what, uh, it's what a ton of, uh, people use for cloud-based storage. In fact, I was doing some research for this presentation and I was curious about Dropbox and I did a little bit of checking on Dropbox and Dropbox actually uses AWS S3 as well. Um, well, they used so to, anyway. that, that, they used to anyway. I don't know if they still do, but they definitely were using it. Did they switch point. to something else? Uh, okay, I, maybe the article I read yeah, but they, but they, but they, but they were using S3 for quite a bit. Yeah. So, I had okay. thought that they were doing, um, like they were running their own data centers for part of their offsites. Oh, okay. And uh, so I've got my Mac installer. I'm going to run this. Just walk through this. There is a hosting provider option, which uh, SafetyNet is a great option for hosting providers. It's something that, that uh, we're about to make standard on all of our hosting provider boxes. Um, if you install as a hosting provider, that basically allows you to have multiple copies of SafetyNet for different customers. But I'm just gonna leave everything on all the defaults here. Run the installer. That's fine. Okay. And so that's that's the installation process. So this is um, this is what you get to after you run the safety net installer. So let, let's talk about. Uh, so the instructions are here. I'm just gonna kind of paraphrase what the instructions are. Uh, 
Uh, so if you want to read these instructions when you install it, go ahead. But basically what they're telling you to do is go to FileMaker Server. So uh, first of all, when that installer ran, let me show you, it created a new folder in your backups folder. There's a now new folder here called safety net. So that's an empty folder and anything that you put in the safety net folder will get backed up to Amazon. So if I go to um, my server admin and I go okay. to backups. So, ba so backup, th we, th this machine, this piece of hardware we're on here, this laptop or whatever this is, this is your server. This is the, your server, correct? Yeah, I happen to be using my Mac laptop as my FileMaker server. So all the steps that you're that I'm doing here, you would do on your FileMaker On the server. server. Just want to make sure I, I missed that. And I'm just deleting something left over from when I was uh, trying something out before. So I, I wanted to delete it so you can see what it, so this is what it's normally going to look like. You come to FileMaker server, you don't have any backup schedules. You know, you've got your, your automatic backup FileMaker thing, but we're not going to touch that or mess with that. What I want to do now is I'm going to create a new backup schedule that's going to write to that safety net folder that I created. And I'm going to call it safety net demo. And uh, you could you could certainly back up all your databases. I've got tons of databases on my server um, because I do a ton of development on it. So I'm just going to pick one particular database. Um, and I play Dungeons and Dragons. So I have my character sheet database that I will back up. Uh, and speaking of maturity, um, and so our backup folder, this is the main change we're gonna make right here, is instead of just going to the backups folder, we're gonna go into that safety net subfolder in the backup folder. Uh, this is a relevant number of backups to keep. Um, if you're using this as your primary backup, you can put a number in there, but safety net will ignore that. Safety net is going, has its own setting for how long to keep backup. So just set that whatever you want, but it will have no effect on safety net. I'll save that. I'm gonna run that. So before I run it, just wanna, yeah, that's empty. Uh, I'm gonna to go to run now. And I think this database is small. It's like six megabytes. It's good for demos. It's got some external container storage. Um, if I show you what the database actually looks like, this is it. Uh, you know, this is just like okay. my Dungeons and Dragons characters. Okay, cool. Uh, I, so the question is, is this thing waits till all the, it's fully written and then it takes it upon itself as a service, it's a separate service that's running on the server and it pushes it up? Yes, and you, whether you meant to, I, I, you probably meant to, but in case you didn't, you had a really critical in, uh, assumption in the thing that you just said there. It waits till it's finished. No, that was on, uh, pur that was on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a really important part of this process. Um, and I was going to talk about that later, but you, but since you brought it up, I think it's a perfect time to talk about it now. The problem with a lot of off-the-shelf software is that they don't know when your backups are running. And so if this backup were to take 30 minutes to run, you know, I mean, this only took 10 seconds, but if it took 30 minutes to run and your backup kicked in 15 minutes halfway through that process, it's going to back up a half-finished file which obviously is unusable. Yeah, um, yeah. so let me help here real quick, just briefly, so I'm going to turn my camera on briefly. So the idea is that, Claris, people say, I get this from IT all the time, and the IT people are people who don't know anything about FileMaker, and part of our job in this community of everyone here that's on YouTube, Twitch, and Discord is to educate your IT people, assuming they're not you, that if they buy an off-the-shelf backup system, whatever, Veritas, or whatever these other various enterprise level backup systems are those backup systems don't know about FileMaker and they don't give a shit, okay just right. let's be clear and so if they see a file regardless of the condition of the file and they think the file is like in the backup area they're going to target it and suck it off the server if the, that backup software sucks that file off and it's not being done written or it's open at the time what happens these things will back up the active databases of so Jesse comes over here real quick for me and plays along with the demo and it sees the files that are over here and it's going to go hey i'm taking those files and it takes them even though they're open and you run and you run the risk of copying the, the copied file becomes damaged the original is probably just fine but the copy it creates could be totally 
uh, hosed, right? So a little unhappy. Yeah, and I've, I've even seen cases where the live file maker, so we've really, we're talking about three copies of the file. We've got yes. your live production yes. copy. Yep, one. Then we've got your file maker backup. Two. And then we've got your offsite backup. Which is the one that and you're I've seen writing. cases. Yes, I've seen cases where if the offsite backup kicks in halfway through the FileMaker backup process, not only will your third file, your offsite backup, be corrupted and only half can finish, it'll actually also mess up your second copy of the file, your backup copy, because the back because it'll lock the file, mm. and when the file gets locked, FileMaker server can't complete the backup process. So you wind up with with a, a useless backup on your hard drive as well as a useless backup on the offsite. Which means that you end up with no backups, basically. No fresh yeah, ones, anyway. Right, no fresh databases, no fresh backups is exactly right. So that was one of the big things that, so SafetyNet, in, in a certain sense, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything revolutionary or earth shattering that you can't do with crash plan or carbonite or, or some other things. But what it does do really well is it knows about FileMate. And it knows about FileMaker server. So when it sees files appear in that backups folder, the first thing it does is it uses the FMS admin command line tool to go to FileMaker server and say, hey, are you running a backup right now? And if FileMaker server says, yeah, I've got this backup schedule running, then SafetyNet just waits a few seconds and then it just loops. And then eventually uh, it'll say, are you running a backup right now? And FileMaker server will say, no, I'm done. Um, and even then, just to be sure, because I've had FileMaker server lie to me about that a couple of times, We'll actually check the size of the file, wait a few seconds, and make sure the size of the file doesn't change, so that we know the filemaker is really, really, really done writing that backup. And so, and and, and and if you're writing your copy off, but filemaker server tries to start a backup, it might try to delete that file or something, right? I mean, do you put a lock on that file or something, or how do you? It's very unlikely that would happen because SafetyNet runs within five minutes of when filemaker server runs. And I can't see any scenario imaginable where FileMaker would would like auto delete a backup that's only five minutes old. Right, but, but I mean, but 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 it, it'll take it maybe long. Safety net might trigger within five minutes, but if you have a slow internet connection or something weird, it could take it thirty minutes to push the file uphill. Right. That's true. FileMaker doesn't normally start deleting backups until seven days after. Or it, I guess it depends on your retention period. If you put a one-day retention period, it's going to delete that file 24 hours after it gets created. Mm. I've never really tried to test backing up a file so large that it took more than 24 hours to okay. back it up with safety net. But no. it is, yeah, you know, that that might be a possibility that I would need to consider. Well, well, I guess, I, yeah, I mean, that could be a, a challenge. I, so it gets, it, I, so of course that leads us to the question of how do you configure your tool? Is it configurable, or is it just it just grabs everything, or just grabs what you sent? Yeah, to I'll show you. Okay. I'll show you. So, um, so the backup, I believe, is is done, and there it is. Um, you know, and there, and uh, there's, there's my database, and there's my external container data. Okay, so I, I forgot so for I forgot for a second. So it's going after things that we specifically target. So we would want to target. Like, yeah, that's uh, why we. Yeah. That's why we have that safety net folder that we create. We don't want to just by default assume that you want offsite backups of everything. Mm. We create that safety net folder so that you can set up your own backup schedules and whichever things you feel like are important enough to back up the offsite, make sure that you also have a backup going into safety net. But the, the, the really nice thing is because we're checking that schedule all the time, you don't need to guess at how long your backup is going to take. You might say, okay, well, my backup is going to run at one in the morning, so I'm going to have my offsite backup run at two in the morning. Okay. And that's fine as long as your backup takes an hour or less. But what happens if your hard drive is slow or you're on AWS and your hard drive gets throttled due to excessive usage and it slows down to much slower than normal? So you're always kind of guessing at how long to set that offsite backup for. Oh. Whereas with safety net, it's always going to kick in within five minutes of that backup finish. Okay, okay. so I think I'm thinking that we have Stephen Delinsky here, but I'm not really sure. Whoever call sign FM. I know forms Stephen us. has Stephen has used safety net before. And he's, okay, he's, well, he's well, there's a, a oh, there he is. So this is Stephen Delinsky is asking the question, and I I really miss seeing you guys not DefCon. I really wish I could go meet talk to Stephen and have lunch or stuff. I mean, this is killing me. I so. Know. He says, you can read the comment, for those of you who can see it, one thing I find missing from the standard FileMaker backups is one, server side plugins, two, server preference schedules and settings, and three, 
is SSL data sh uh, a period. Should your server be hosed, you want to get back as fast as possible, uh, possible with safety net. I guess he's asking a question. Could it could it help in grabbing these vital data? Include you know. Yes, it can. I, that's I didn't even think about those specific things, but I'm glad. I'm Stephen. I'm glad you asked that question because because <laughs> uh, I, I will I will make sure if I if I forget to answer that remind me. But I will when I show you the safety net interface. I'll show you you can add additional backup folders. Ooh, yeah, it's a good um, one. It's a good one, Dolinsky. That's good. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Yep. Okay. Keep going. So Jesse. anything that's in the safety net folder is fair game, right? We 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 know that we want to go ahead and back that up. So uh, now we get back. Here's here's remember this is the screen we came to after we ran the installer. It hasn't actually run the backup yet, and the reason is because I go to this admin screen, and the administrator credentials are the same as my um, FileMaker server. So in fact, we just pass this login through, and so as long as you know your FileMaker server admin credentials, then you know your safety net admin credentials because they're the same. So this is, this is the screen where you kind of, conf there's not a lot of configuration in safety net, but this is what there is. Um, the big obvious thing right here is this yellow button, log in with Amazon. So we decided, remember I talked there was like dev pay and they scrapped it. And we really didn't want to implement our own kind of like legal agreements and recurring billing stuff and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we could actually probably do the credit card part of it using plastic. But there's a lot more than just charging the credit card. You know, you need to handle cancellations and there's customer service and there's, you know, chargebacks and stuff like that. We didn't want to do any of that stuff. So, um, so we decided to use the Amazon payment feature. So the really nice thing about this is you already, if, if, you, if you buy stuff on Amazon, you already have an Amazon account. So you just log in with your Amazon account. And then what will happen is the safety net bills will just get run through the same credit card that you use for your Amazon payments. So um, before I log in, I want to show this thing right here, AWS Region Virginia. This is a new feature that's in Safety Net 3, is that we now automatically detect out of the 22 or 23 AWS regions around the world, um, the old version of Safety Net only went to Virginia. Um, you get to East 1. Um, but yeah, now it'll go to Singapore or Can we you know, the one in South Africa. Can we override Wherever you want. Can we you cannot override it, but what you can do... <laughs> is that important? If it's important, I can add it. Well, only because Claris does this all the time. Would you like cloud two? Or we're going to take your billing zip code. Oh, you can't, we, we, you need to override that. No, I'm sorry. You can't override that. You're screwed. So I, I don't know. Delinsky, if so, you feedback in here, if you, I mean, I don't know that it's really that important because it is detecting where your FileMaker server is. Yeah, what it'll do so is that's it's, it's doing kind of... a latency check to each of those each of those locations to see which one is the fastest. Ooh. Um, uh, so it's always going to give you whichever one is fastest. I I can't s I'll tell you what. If somebody out there would really like the ability to override that and go to a slower, farther away data center, <laughs> let me know, <laughs> and I will I will make that a pull down menu for you. Okay. Um, wow. But yes, I, I'm in Georgia. So Virginia is my closest one. It automatically detects that by doing a latency-based lookup. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I wanted to show that before I proceeded. So now I'm gonna go ahead and proceed with the login, log in with Amazon. I'm just gonna log in with my normal credentials that I use when I buy stuff from Amazon. It takes me to a payment processing screen where it shows me my registered payment methods that I've got in Amazon. I'm gonna use the only one I've got. And then it's just a legal thing of use my selected payment method for future purchases and payments of this method to this merchant. I'm just saying, say yes, that's fine. I store those settings. And what I just did there is it. I'm going to show you more stuff in this demo, but there's nothing else left okay. that you need to do. That that was the entire setup process right there. Uh, in you... fact, I, before before you say anything, let me jump over to manage files because it's going to kick in in four minutes and I don't want to miss it if it kicks in but no, all right go ahead okay so um you have this sentence in there that was really like a, a sales weasel sentence can the part where it said okay you're going to be charged 99 cents plus one dollar for every gigabyte plus another dollar if we feel like it and I'm like what the hell was that so I have no idea oh, okay much... all right so let me go back to the admin thing here's how our pricing works our pricing is hold on where it's oh, let me go to the help page here's the pricing 
So we charge a base charge of 99 cents a month. That's just automatic. Okay. And then on top of that 99 cents, we charge one penny per thousand items that we write. Um, mm -hmm. cause that's basically what Amazon charges us. Okay. Uh, and then we charge anywhere between a dollar to a nickel per gigabyte stored. Um, and it's a tiered pricing. So like it's a dollar a gigabyte for the first 10 and then 25 cents a gigabyte up to a hundred and then 10 cents up to 500 and then five cents a gigabyte over 500. Um, and then here's some, Oh, some you put it. Okay, actual, good. You put examples. I was about to go. That's too much math. I am too old to do that. All right. So let me see 20 gigs. You, there's twenty dollars a month, or fifty gigs. Is, wait, wait. That's okay. That's fifty gigs that you request to to back up, but that would depend upon the size of your file and how often you call the backup. Right? It's fifty gigs of storage. It's not a fifty gigs of transfer. So if you have, if you transfer the same fifty gig file um, every single day, yeah. and you only decide to keep one copy of it. Well, you have to keep a minimum of three. Let's say you keep three copies of it. That's going to be 150 gigs, not 50 times they're not 1500 gigs. So we're not charging based on the amount of data transferred. We're charging the amount of data that is stored on Amazon server. Okay. And then, and then somewhere in the settings, we had the part where we specified the number to keep. I missed that little. Yes. Yep. That was right here in the admin section. It defaults to seven. Okay. Okay. It defaults to seven. You can set it as low as three and you can set it as high as 366. And if you want more than 366, let me know and I'll make it higher. I just didn't want people to accidentally put an extra zero there and keep back it for 10 years that they didn't need to. Yeah, I think the biggest one I ever did one time was two years. We did weeklies for two years or something. Um, okay, yeah, if you, if you need that, let me know and I'll bump it up. No, I'm just I'm just talking out my ass. It's not to, that often. Uh, okay, we got yeah, quite... We used to set it to 99 for the on-site servers because that's the max that the FMS admin console used to let you do. Yeah, okay. so, so 99 uh, copies of a weekly backup would get you almost to two full years. And then it looks like there's a question mm -hmm. from T Tarn. And, and there, there is a, a little model down here where you can, if you know that your oh. databases are 12 gigs, you uh -huh. can type 12,000 megabytes. Mm -hmm. How many days do you want to keep? Let's say you want to keep five days. Mm -hmm. And then we compress the databases automatically. So if you sit on, on average, FileMaker databases compress down to 40% of their original size. So if we assume that they compress to 40% and it's 12 gigs and you're going to keep five days worth, then that winds up being 24.43 gigs stored per month. And with the 99 cent base charge, it winds up being $14 a month. This is pretty, so always... this is pretty damn cheap insurance folks. Uh, 15 bucks. Um... Yeah. I've got a slide that shows a comparison of the pricing and for, especially for small files, it tends to be cheaper than a lot of the other commercial options out there. Um, Okay, uh, we do have a. I mean, I'm going to throw this at you, Jesse. Hopefully, people are paying attention here. Uh, I'm going to go to Discord. Let me interrupt one sec before you do that. Arr! This is just about to kick in the automatic Arr! file backup. <laughs> here, I just want to. I just want to interrupt for one sec because this is the this is the exciting part. It's actually doing the thing right now. It's compressing the files and it, it finished. That's it's done. Woo! Little fireworks. Uh, well, what so, does it? Well, what does it say? Okay, but does it say successful or failed, or we just we just assume that it's always perfect? Yep. We assume that it's successful, and if I go to Gmail, uh, it hasn't showed up yet. But any second now, I'll get an email notifying me that that backup ran successfully. Oh, come on! You've got to be kidding! I, to me, that's a really important part because. If you don't know that the backup ran. I know, but um, okay, so let me help. Uh, okay, there we go. Delinsky is about to light your ass on fire, I hope. Right? <laughs> so it, it would tell you if there's an error message. Okay, if there was an error message, that's the only big red box. Okay, let me help. So those of you who, okay, let me help everyone out. Don't listen to Jesse. If you have a customer and you send them a <laughs> message every hour or every day, Hey, your server's good. Hey, your server's good. Hey, your server's good. Hey, your server's good. Eventually, they're going to have a bunch of those. They're going to mark them as spam, and they don't see them. And then when your server finally one day goes, Shit, it's on fire. You're all going to die. It goes into spam. You don't see it anyway. So my suggestion has always been with Claris and anyone else, just make sure that we, the endless babble of it was successful, we can suppress that and only send me when the server's on fire and we're about to die, right? Yeah, so that's what this is right here. This this admin section here. I I, I want to show you the emails. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, you can you can um, 
Yes, you, you can specify, I want it on everything or I just want it on failures. Uh, and you can also specify, by default, it's always gonna come to your Amazon email address. Um, and then it can also be configured to go to additional, uh, uh, additional email addresses if you want. Uh, Tarn Imans uh, just commented, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was on uh, Twitch and it came back, I'm putting on Discord so people can see it right here. He says, yes, choosing the AWS region would be useful. Some of us have SaaS agreements with our clients that stipulate which countries our client's data is allowed to be stored in. Using the default AWS might not always be suitable. I that is a great point that I did not think of. So I'm going to make that change. That's why that we down. listen to feedback and we give it right to Jesse. Yeah. Now, if it doesn't show up in the product, it means that Jesse doesn't love you and he doesn't listen to you. But that's exactly it's it a means. small enough company I that I, I I would be shocked if Jesse didn't put that in the product. Right? That's how it works when you have a small business. I will definitely make that change. Awesome. I'm writing it down on my phone right now. Now listen. I'm getting a weird error message that I had that I didn't get when I was testing before. What is when it's trying to actually. When it's trying to send uh, an email, I got a thing about invalid XML. So I wrote down the time that happened. I'm going to go to the log and check that out, figure out what's going on there. I don't know if it's a, if it's a network hiccup or something else. Um, it's weird because I did this exact same thing like an hour ago, right before we got started. So All I right, will so, check that out. So everyone, just just just, just so Je I'm going to mute Jesse. I'm pressing a button. I'm muting Jesse. Jesse can't hear me anymore. So sh this is what happens with 360 works. They run into problems, but they fix them pretty rapidly. And so you really don't worry about the problems too often because they behind the scenes will fix them. And that's why I support the company and the product, right? It's not because it's perfect. It's just because it will get fixed, right? Right, okay, unmute Jesse. There we go, beep. So I am going to <laughs> run this. I wanna run this again. I wanna see if that error happens consistently or if it's just a one-shot deal. All right, Canberra so 57, kind of... people are typing, question Canberra, I stepped, oh, you stepped out for a bit, okay, I don't know, uh, so I missed, it only backs up to, okay, he wants to know if it only backs up to AWS, so backup, so Canberra works literally on, <laughs> and so he's not, mm. and and he is, uh, he's, he has a squad of pit bulls and machine guns and security, cyber security people, so I can imagine him being nervous about where it would go on Amazon, so can he mm -hmm. target someplace else besides Amazon? No, this is very, very specific to the S3 APIs. What I will say though, is that uh, it can work with AWS GovCloud, um, which is basically AWS's uh, service that is partitioned off for only US access. Uh, and I haven't used it myself, but there's all sorts of compliance features that it has for government contractors. I believe that's what the CIA uses for a lot of their data processing. Uh, the, um, the, gov so I, the government at AWS, is that what you said? Uh, that's what they're using? Or, yeah, GovCloud. Gov GovCloud, yeah. So um, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna, so to go ahead. But I got other, other comments here. So I'll, I'll, tr I'll, I'll look at that afterwards and figure out why that is happening. Sorry, the go ahead. Water off a duck's back. It's like normal. So uh, so that's Ken Bear's question. Uh, Stephen Delinsky says, well, okay, let me back up. Tanya from New Zealand is the one who had the question about different SAS agreements and different regions and stuff. So that's Tanya from New Zealand, or if you run into her. Um, and then uh, Delinsky says, what efforts would it take to use Wasabi? And I don't know what Wasabi is in a technical sense besides spicy stuff. Yeah, I, I you know, Stephen emailed me about that a few months or a year or two ago, maybe. And I looked into it. It looks like Wasabi is is essentially kind of saying it's supposed to be API compliant, compatible with S3, um, but just a lot cheaper. Um, I didn't, I wasn't that interested in that because for one thing, we don't, you know, we're, we're charging our prices. We're not charging the S3 prices. So, you know, I mean, if we used a cheaper service, that might increase our markups or our profit margin, but it wouldn't change the price that we bill for S3. So I don't think it would have any effect. Uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not allowed to have a profit. You're supposed to do this for free for people. That's what I've been told on these live streams. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of work here, uh, as you know, oh, as you know, for the stuff that you do. Oh, um, yeah. So and the other thing is that we're using a lot of uh, S3 features, like we're using the object. I haven't gotten to it yet, but there's something I'm, I'm excited about to talk about, which is the new object locking feature that S3 has. We use all of their multi-part uh, upload stuff. 
Uh, we use a lot of IAM policies that control access to who can do what to different buckets. So we're using a lot more than just the S3 APIs by themselves. There's a whole kind of management layer that goes on behind here. And maybe Wasabi does all that, but I don't really see that the, the big benefit of trying to see if they've completely replicated the whole AWS all right. infrastructure so, to save on the already low cost on S3. All right, well, you know how people are with a buck, right? Um, so mm -hmm. uh, so Aaron P is also chiming in with Delinsky and they're all upselling Wasabi here. So if you folks want to, I'm gonna make a suggestion. Um, if you have a comment about this and you want to Slack, not Slack, uh, message Jesse in the most appropriate way. Yeah, just send me, uh, my email is jesse at 360works.com. And I'd be curious to know how that would, how that would help customers. Um, you know, I mean, it, like I said, it might cut my costs a little bit, um, but I'm curious, I, I don't see how that would actually help a customer. And if there's something I'm overlooking and, and there's a benefit there that I don't see other than the actual cost of storage, let me know and I'll be happy to look into it. Okay, yeah, because uh, 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 Steven's saying, ah, it's 80% cheaper than S3, and there's no egress or API fees, and 11 by 9 of, of data durability. Okay, I got all that except 11 by 9. 11 by 9. That that's, 11... The, that's the thing I was talking about before, that the, the 11 nines is 99.99. .99 oh, that one, yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, I thought it was, it was talking like, uh, you know, th uh, what's... Uh, uh, 24 365 so 11 day hours a day for nine days straight or something I, I was confused so I'm, I'm yeah stupid. but again I don't see that as a that's not a customer benefit um, you know that might be a small 360 works benefit in terms of reducing our cost slightly but I don't see there being a customer benefit for that because okay. it's not going to get us we're not going to change our prices you know uh, by switching to that it's going to be more development work not less so go ahead, we're not go ahead gonna, and switch to your you know, camera real quick jesse we'll just go we're gonna have a couple yeah. questions here we're gonna if you can bounce back and forth that'll make your life a little easier for people absolutely so aaron goes uh because he's talking about this other thing he goes uh so it's uh, looks like safety net is not charging for egress if you need to restore your backups is that correct question mark that is correct there the only charges that we have is the 99 cents the one penny per thousand uh, write operations, and then a charge for the storage capacity itself on there. There is no charge for data transfer into S3, and we also don't charge for data transfer out of S3. Okay, next question from Jadler102 from Twitch. Welcome, glad, qu great questions, keep them up. Uh, are files encrypted in transit or at rest, right? Uh, HIPAA compliance in terms of servers that data resides on, et cetera. Uh, they are definitely encrypted in, during transit. We're using SSL for everything that we do. Um, on the at rest, uh, that code was written a few years ago, and I went back and forth a few times on that, and I don't know the answer to that offhand. Um, but Richard, if you can get that person's contact information, I will find out the answer and let them know. Well, okay, so Jacob Taylor, my IT guy, goes, if your files are eared, then they'd be encrypted on both ends already. Um, yeah, so I understand all the people who are HIPAA here, and I understand all those kind of conversations. Yeah, I think that the S, I think everything on S3 is automatically encrypted, uh, at, encrypted at rest. Uh, what, I, what we're not doing is we're not using our own custom keys. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but yeah, if you were to rip the hard drive out of one of those machines or find it in a dumpster somewhere, you wouldn't be able to get the data off of it. Right, 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 right. So yeah, so, uh, but the, the, I know that Amazon has HIPAA, you can sign off a thing, and it used to be a thing where you had to pay Amazon, but now it's like kind of HIPAA is kind of a standard thing for them, isn't that mm -hmm. a standard thing? Yeah, now? they used to have a BAA, uh, Business Associate Agreement, and it was about $2,000 a month, yeah, actually. Yeah, it was they really expensive. Like an yeah. hourly fee that was quite high in order to have a dedicated piece of bare metal box just for you. Yeah, and now they've- but Yeah, I don't think they do that anymore. I think, well, they, because they've uh, wired it into the rest of their stuff, is that how that works, Jesse? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know what they did to not need to do that anymore, but what, whatever they did, they're not requiring that anymore. Okay, so uh, D uh, Steven Delinsky says, can you manually delete backups off of AWS and is it in immediate? Mm -hmm. And if you want to demo that, you can switch back to your screen yeah, if you so, want. So let me, um, so I'm gonna jump to, to some slides because that's actually gonna, I'm gonna answer that question in the course of some of the slides that I have. Okay, great. Uh, and, and 
Um, so the short answer to your question is no, you cannot, we took away the delete button. Not only did we take away the delete button, we actually, um, this is one of the uh, jumping ahead of my slides, this thing right here, we're using the new object locking feature. I probably made that harder to read, not easier. Uh, there's a new object locking feature in Amazon uh, called uh, Worm, write once, read many. And what that does is it means that when we upload your files to Amazon, we have it set now so that there's an automatic three-day retention period where nobody can delete those files. You can't delete them. 360 Works can't delete them. Amazon can't delete them. They just simply cannot be deleted, short of like, you know, charging the data center with a semi-truck and burning it down or something like that. Um, even that wouldn't do it because they have multiple, they, they're, they're, they're replicated across multiple availability zones. Can I ask a question? So, can, I, can I ask you a question about right on that topic? I'm not mm -hmm. changing topics. So S3, yeah. when you write to S3, it still writes, uh, it replicates into the availability zones within a region, but it's not cross region still, correct? Is that, do I have that correct? Correct. It's not cross region. Uh, right, right. S3 is regional. Regional. Um, so, Would so, yes. so, so for those so of you, if, don't... if you took out all three or four data centers within a given region, then you would lose data. So, so for those of you catch keeping up with the, uh, the 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 senior people at the conversation, a a Amazon region is a geographical area where there'll be multiple unmarked buildings that will contain data centers, and those and the if you write to S three, it writes to each of those buildings secretly. You know, Amazon knows about this, but it's not like on the street corner. Hey, visit Amazon and get a tour. Right, they're kind of unmarked. Yeah, and they're like twenty to fifty miles apart too. So it's not like, you know, it's not like a fire somewhere is going to burn down all their data centers. Yeah. All right, keep so this, going. This worm feature, this worm feature is a really. Um, at, at first, it's um, it, it, it's it's a really. Basically, what it does is it means your computer can't be. Uh, you can't. It, it means that you've got three days to catch ransomware. That's really what this boils down to. If you could delete the files, then let's assume that somebody can RDP into your server. Let's say you got a really bad password. Somebody RDPs into your server, and let's say you use the same password for your FileMaker server, which of course you would never do, but let's say that you did, and they got into your safety net thing, and then they go and they click delete, and they delete not only all of your backups and production files on your box, they just click the delete button, and now all your offsite backups are also deleted. Um, that's what we wanted to prevent. So we're using the new object locking feature that Amazon has in, there's two modes that's called governance mode and compliance mode. Governance mode means that somebody with special access is able to delete that file. We're doing compliance mode. Compliance mode means nobody, 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 not even Am Jeff Bezos cannot delete your file. Um, so, so that means that if somebody were to get on your server and then let's say encrypt your files, which we should, we've actually had happen to some of our customers, uh, if they were to encrypt your files or delete your files, or an angry employee, um, or uh, just a stupid administrator, or anything like that happened, you cannot, nobody can delete these files for a minimum of three days. So that was, we, we intentionally removed that delete button as a feature. What, we, what we've replaced it with is basically this. How many days would you like to leave these files on the offsite back before they are deleted? You can change this whenever you want. So you can change this, like I said, as low as three days, but you can't go lower because we require three days that you can use the files. Well, when you, and this three days is enforced because you set it up with your overarching provisioning from Amazon, right? With three. That's right. There's no. That's not configurable. So I can't get um, into. The, I can't. Customer. I can't get into the HTML in here and kind of jerry rig the web page to let me do that. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Nothing that you could do or I could do could possibly bypass that three days. That's an Amazon feature. Um, so unless they had a, unless they've have a bug in their code, which I highly doubt, um, then no no stupidity on my part, your part, or your user's part could possibly delete those files prior to three days. Um, and that's a really important feature compared to doing your own homegrown backups. Yes, um, yes. You know, if, if you're just writing your own shell scripts to rsync them somewhere, uh, then you have to embed your password somewhere in that script. Your script can rsync to a server or do an SSH or an SCP or an FTP or whatever, what, ha what have you. If you're using Dropbox, your credentials to Dropbox have to be embedded somewhere in order to do that. Um, and if a knowledgeable attacker were to get on your computer 
and they can crack apart whatever shell script you wrote. They're able to get that stuff, and then they're able to get not only to the files on your server, but your copies of the files that are offsite. And using this object locking feature protects us from that. No, there's just it, it's there's there's no uh, there, there's no way to get around that. There's no end run that you can do to get rid of or delete this file. You can't overwrite them. You can't change them, or anything like that. You actually can appear to delete them and appear to change them. But what Amazon is doing under the hood is it actually keeps that original version for three days. Ah. Um, and uh, so if you ever actually have this happen um, and uh, you know, somebody could, let's just say it, it could appear that your data is lost. For instance, somebody hacks onto your server and uh, they go into your safety net folder and they they encrypt the file that's there and then they rerun the safety net backup and it would appear to overwrite the file that's sitting on Amazon. If that were to happen, contact 360 works. We can go directly into the S3 interface with the browser. We can go to that, any version that was written within the last three days and manually get it for you. Um, and, and there's no way that those, those uh, we, we can't delete them because nobody can, but we could retrieve them uh, if, as long as they were uh, done in the last three days, no matter what an attacker or malicious employee or somebody like that did. So, um, it's, it's so, so Stephen, that's a really good question about the delete thing, and the answer is no, but it's very intentional. Yeah, um, I have a couple comments for those of you wondering about this. So uh, this, this, and, and we've all run it, well, if you're an established consultancy, you probably run into this, but we got a call one day from Fed, Federal Express and they got ransomware on a FileMaker server. It was really ugly. Um, this would have helped mm. prevent that. Um, they weren't our mm -hmm. customer. They were just desperately calling anyone with the word FileMaker in their consulting name and trying to find mm. help. Um, and then yeah. um, and it also happened to another customer of ours where uh, they had a password of 1234, and they just thought that would be great forever. I'm thinking of, a doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Jacob works with this customer. And, the, and, div and someone got into the server and just thought it'd be fun just to delete all the files. And so this would prevent that. My only thought on this being kind of the overly paranoid person I am, just because you're paranoid. What's that line? I, I, I just be uh, just because I'm paranoid just doesn't paranoid doesn't mean people are out to get you, you right? Exactly. <laughs> I would almost be inclined to set this thing to five days, uh, Jesse. I know that people may not want to pay for that, but um, so you can you can increase the number here, increase it or decrease it, whatever you no, want. I'm, ta I'm talking about um, your hard safety, your hard safety safety you've got oh i see i see just, uh, just me you know just why, don't, me. why don't we make that a poll if, if anybody wants to email me about that um, okay email be... email jesse yeah. email jesse on this um and uh and and so if if like it costs money because you can't get rid of those backups but then your right. your ass is protected from from an absolute brute force attack other than like a uh, terrorist attacking the building and blowing up all the buildings, which would be amazing. So all the buildings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Jesse at 360 works.com. Tell them what you would like. Uh, my vote is for more than three days. It can't, the problem is we all have to live with it together together because he's going to set it for the entire product. <laughs> yeah, it's it not something you can set that, defeat the that defeats the purpose. It can't be like, oh, I can customize what I want. It doesn't work that way. It's it's a hard, which means that if you do criminal kind of stuff and you want to delete the evidence, the evidence won't be deleted for five days. So think about it from that perspective as well for those of you underhanded people out there. There is a question <laughs> here from Lewis, um, and he's saying, any plans to release a Linux version of SafetyNet? We've got, so, so safety net runs fine on Linux. The thing that's missing is an installer. Um, we are working on an installer for MirrorSync for, for Linux. Uh, when that is done, it will be very, very easy to reuse that installer for safety net. So the, sh so the kind of, the, the longer answer is, if you were really determined and you knew how to use Tomcat, I'd be happy to just send you the actual Tomcat web app at safetynet.war file, and you can install that and it would work. Um, but you'd have to know what you're doing. And so if you feel like messing with that, let me know. And I'll just, actually, you can get it yourself. Download the safety net installer. And if you go in the installer data folder, you'll see a file there called safetynet.war. That's a web archive. It's a Tomcat web application. Um, I've never done it before, but I'm fairly, uh, I think it's quite likely that it would just work uh, if you put it on Linux. Um, if you would like to have a little bit nicer, better option, give us a little bit of time. Once we get that installer working for MirrorSync on Linux, we'll quickly follow it up with an installer for Zulu and an installer for SafetyNet. 
can so I? They're all three of our kind of Tomcat web-based applications. Yeah, can I ask a dumb question? So I know that there's this CentOS uh, conversation about Claris. Claris built their Linux version for CentOS, and then there's this licensing mm -hmm. mayhem with CentOS. So it looks like Claris is most likely going to use Ubuntu for their new versions of Linux, or it will be compatible with Ubuntu, right? So the question is, is, mm -hmm. is your installer have to be different between CentOS and Ubuntu, or is it kind of like? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's, that's the thing. The application itself doesn't. SafetyNet itself is going to run fine on any Linux operating system, but the installer is where we get into the peculiarities and differences between various distributions of Linux. Ugh, and that's um, going to so, suck. You know, some of them are going to use Yum, and some of them are going to use... Um, you yeah. know, apt-get and, and various stuff. And so we need to come up with a package that we, we need to figure out which distribution FileMaker is going to run on before we target anything. Uh, okay, so Ruben says that he absolutely refuses to use 360 Works uh, because apparently it's not <laughs> safe for his illegal activities. So it, it, it help, will help incriminate him. So Ruben's one of our ongoing people here. He, we, we appreciate the comments uh, uh, seriously. But, yes, it's just a thought, right, if you're going to do some malicious stuff, right, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is not a good product for somebody that wants to do more. Okay, uh, Dolinsky I did ask the question over here. I'm going to bring it up real briefly. Steven says, the other files and the configuration, yeah, you have to get to that. He is also looking for super container data to be moved and stuff like that. So, so one of the things that changed in version 3 is that, so in version 1, we were only really set up to work with FileMaker databases, just .fp7 or .fmp12 files. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the, the whole UI kind of fell apart if you try to upload 10,000 files, like with external container storage or super container files or anything like that. So we've now, um, optimized that a lot. So now you can, you can store an unlimited number of files. When we go to fetch that list of files to display in the web interface, we're fetching them one directory at a time. So it doesn't matter if there's a hundred thousand items in a folder you haven't expanded, we don't fetch that folder. Um, whereas previously we would have just run out of memory if we tried to fetch 100,000 items. So we're much more optimized to store lots and lots of individual files, not just a few handfuls of FileMaker databases. So that wraps up our recording and interview with Jesse Barnum of 360 Works. They make great products for the FileMaker platform. In fact, they make some mission critical products for the FileMaker platform. And of course, if you liked what you saw today, Feel free to reach out to Jesse at jesse at 360works.com and tell him that maybe he should come back and give us more videos on his other products. He actually has so many products that we couldn't possibly cover it in one broadcast. So we're inviting him back as often as he has time to come back to show us his great products. It's actually such a funny thing. He has more great products then he has time to show us. So Richard Carlton here for fmtraining.tv. Please like or subscribe to our videos. We really appreciate it. If you want to catch the broadcast live, check out fmtraining.tv. And that's 1 o'clock Pacific time every day, Monday through Friday. We don't normally broadcast on Saturdays or Sundays, but every once in a while, We'll do that too. So sometimes it's just around the clock every day. So if you're interested in more great FileMaker training, check out our website there at fmtrain.tv, and I'll catch you next time.